Hi, folks. I'm here with Gigi Foster. Thanks for coming on, Gigi. Gigi, take me back to 2019-20. Where were you and what were you doing and what were you thinking? Well, I was in Sydney. I was still a professor at University of New South Wales doing the teaching and research and engagement that uh, I'm hired to do. And uh, the end, end of 2019, I really didn't pick that anything was out of the ordinary. Uh, I wasn't following all those early reports particularly, but then it became very obvious that something was taking people's attention by storm around the end of February 2020. And as it happened at the time, I was doing a talk radio show with Peter Martin on ABC Radio National. And the first time that I came out publicly talking about COVID was in one of the shows that we did, um, which was uh, around in March 2020. And uh, when the government announced lockdowns, I basically said I didn't think that was a good idea. We should be protecting the elderly because that's obviously the group was especially at risk of COVID, but not locking down healthy young people. And that caused both my producer's jaw to drop and my co-host's jaw to drop. And so at that point, I really started to realize that something was possessing people and decisions were, were going to be somehow a little bit different um, in terms of how they were made and their consequences than what I have experienced in Australia since coming here about 20 years ago. What what do you think that caused the, the jaw dropping? Just take me through that again. Well, we were in the recording studio at uh, ABC, the Ultimo Studios there in, in uh, sort of the Broadway area. And we both had our, you know, mics and our headphones on and we were just recording what we we're going to say uh, it was a pre-record about the COVID lockdowns and the response to COVID, which was just beginning to develop at that time. This would have been probably about the 26th of March, 2020. And as we usually did, Peter would do a little intro and then I would give my kind of two cents about whatever the topic was. And this is this was called The Economists. It still actually plays the reruns still play on ABC Radio National. And this particular program was about the COVID response. And so I just went on a bit of a monologue about how I thought that it was not appropriate for us to be locking down the whole healthy population. And we should allow people to go to the pub and see their friends and all these things, just because it was so obvious that, that A, the COVID issue was not going to be a big deal for people who were young and healthy, and B, that that kind of draconian response was completely unprecedented and really couldn't be justified. It was obviously going to be costly. So it just seemed to me obvious, you know, uh, and I had really not talked to many people outside of my family and my my sort of social circles and my co-authors about the COVID thing uh, at that point. And so I wasn't really prepared for the reaction that my producer had or my, my co-host had. They stared at me like I just you know come down out of outer space. Um, and so I realized at that moment something was going differently in their heads than than what usually I was used to, right? Where we would talk about economic issues or economic policies or concepts, and there would be maybe sometimes a little bit of an uh, kind of confused expression, but not an expression of you're saying something totally heretical, Gigi. You know, this is not uh, this is not what we expected, and they did, to their credit, play that episode with my monologue pretty much as I said it. But as we went on in the in that series uh, for the next, I don't know, it was, must have been a few months, uh, it became difficult to say what I really thought. And we had I had to really negotiate with the producer about what would be acceptable to say. I remember at one point suggesting uh, maybe a year later that we talk about vaccinations and the you know inappropriateness of mandating vaccinations. And that was absolutely not OK. I was absolutely thought of as an anti-vaxxer and somebody who was endangering others, uh, you know, giving bad health advice. And in fact, after that March 26, 2020 show, the ABC's listeners did respond in kind. They they wrote back to the, the ABC saying that this woman was a danger to public health and should be taken off the air. Her statement should be retracted, et cetera, et cetera. So that, again, gave me a signal that something was rotten in Denmark. Mm. Yeah. Um, what was you and your family's response to that? Well, I, I guess I... <laughs> I'm very lucky because I, uh, first of all, I was uh, raised by parents who were very, very loving and instilled in me a deep sense of my own self-worth and, and value, quite apart from whether or not that value is validated by people outside my family. So I kind of didn't really care personally whether other people thought that I was spewing nonsense. I thought it said more about them. 
um, because to my mind, what I was saying was totally logical and sensible. And the fact that they wouldn't even engage with it and discuss these issues with me, like the danger of COVID to different people, was to me uh, just an indicator that their mind was captured in some way. We weren't able to have normal conversations. That's not about me. That's about them. right? And, and the epithets, anti-vaxxer or neoliberal Trump cannot death cult warrior, as came up a little later, or you know, piece of human excrement. I mean, I got all sorts of epithets leveled at me through all sorts of mediums. And and, you know, these really, again, told me more about the people talking about me rather than about me. So I just didn't take it to heart. And I was also extremely lucky. My entire family, children, uh, even my, my co-authors, close co-authors, all were basically on my side. And the third thing that I was very lucky about is that for years before COVID, I had been studying things like corruption and power and love and loyalty and group influence as an economist, as a, as a behavioral economist, somebody who's interested in human motivation and psychology. My mom was a psychologist. So I was already primed to see some of the phenomena that were clearly so important during COVID for what they were, rather than being deluded into thinking that we were actually seeing anything related to health promotion or, or science. Um, I'm interested as to as an economist, why did Australia not follow the dedicated pandemic plan that they had in place? Well, Russell, you should read my book, The Great COVID Panic, which is behind me, um, which my co-authors and I put together out of our own frustration as a kind of uh, cathartic labor of love from about 2020, uh, maybe October 2020 through May 2021 where we explore exactly answers to those kinds of questions. Why did we not do what we have written down in the past that we would do? Right? Uh, why did we not engage in the sort of debate about optimal policies that we normally have? Why were the government's draconian COVID responses not subjected to the same kind of cost-benefit evaluation that most government policies are subjected to. Um, in fact, it still has not um, happened that any government in Australia has offered a cost-benefit analysis to support lockdowns or vaccine mandates. I mean, in fact, this is why I wrote the second book that I wrote about lockdowns and, and in Australia called Do Lockdowns and Border Closures Serve the Greater Good with Sanjeev Sablock. That came out in 2022 because I wasn't seeing a cost benefit analysis from any place uh, that was an authority. So, you know, we we did have to ask these questions. Why did these normal things not happen? And to our minds, the answer is a combination of uh, many different factors. But one of the ones that I think I did not anticipate was the crowd formation, the, the herd mentality that that um, hijacked people's minds during this time, starting in around April 2020. People most people in Australia stopped being able to actually reckon with data, to use their minds, to engage with information and think about it for themselves. They were so uh, afraid of COVID that they had become vulnerable to being captured by this crowd mentality. And we have seen crowds in the past. We've seen highly destructive crowds like in the 1930s in Germany or in the witch hunts in my country of birth. There are times when whole societies can be just caught up in one obsession and everything else that's usually important in normal times just gets pushed aside out of this great fear and this great this great emotive um, shared emotive content and it gives people a great sense of security and kind of fellowship to be in this crowd but their brains then become merely an instrument of the crowd so people started to simply justify and rationalize what the crowd was spewing out which was the mainstream narrative on the television and this is why we would have conversations i'm sure you had this experience too russell with people who are on the other side of these ideological divides and you would give them information actual facts you know like the danger of covid from worldometer or you know al world and data or whatever you say look it's not really killing many kids maybe we don't need to vaccinate the kids and and there was an inability to process that information because the brain was no longer actually working as an information processing organism it was working as a rationalization machine for what the crowd wanted you to follow and to believe at that time very orwellian so that was a that was something i did not anticipate but i think it had a large um it played a large role in keeping the the madness going for a couple of years in Australia. And there are plenty of other factors that we also talk about in the Great COVID Panic, economic factors, political factors, um, rot and decay in science, um, you know, a lot of things to do with power dynamics. So, I mean, it would take uh, three hours to go through all of those factors. I put to you, dear Professor, that that hasn't ended yet. I agree. And it's getting I, It's getting worse in some ways. Absolutely. And I, I had the experience myself 
of two highly respected friends of mine, highly educated, very intelligent. And I said to them, human rights, you too have stood for it all of your lives. Your libertarian stand, you've stood for this all of your lives. This has been a your compassion. And they said, oh, this, this isn't a human rights issue or a libertarian issue, Russell. This is a health issue. Yep. I, I nearly fell off the back of my chair in the restaurant. But then I said, but children, this won't affect children. They said, they've got to be vaccinated. I said, why? They said, because they're the spreaders. Like it was just rubbish. Yeah, I know. And to, to mask up children at school where they're breathing in their own air the whole time. You know, these things that we did were horrific in Australia. In, in, in Look, in another country, you could say, well, that's, that's not here. But the fact that we shot people with rubber bullets who were trying to say, no, this isn't right. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely unconscionable. I mean, what we've observed here has really changed my view of the Australian culture and the the, the ability of Australians to reconstruct a good future. I mean, I, I'm still working towards that and I hope it will happen. But the degree of compliance we saw here with absolutely indefensible policies uh, was was very frightening. And, you know, I, I too had that experience where people, it was almost like they forgot that, that health reasons and emergency, you know, crises invented by governments are a normal way of governments reaching beyond their remit and abusing their citizens. If you look in history, that's what happens. I mean, the persecution of the Jews in the in World War II was often justified using this notion of, you know, we have to cleanse, we have to get rid of the dirty, we have to, you know, there's the unwashed and then the clean. The same kind of divisive rhetoric was used. Health. Right. So so we have to be we have to be scholars of history and recognize we cannot escape our nature. And this is what happens when people have too much power and those in their charge take their eye off the ball and they become politically apathetic and they are they get scared and then they just look to the people in authority to save them. That is a recipe for abuse. And we got that abuse in spades in this country. And I agree with you. We're still getting it. And it was every premier. It was the prime minister, it was the full cabinet, it was the health minister. Um, and it couldn't have been just power. They, they took the, the same story and swallowed it. I mean, Gladys Berry oh, yeah. of, of all people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But imagine what would happen. I mean, I, I kept thinking about this from the politician standpoint, because obviously I wanted to do everything I could to try to stop this, you know, torpedoing of our ship right during the time it was happening. And I I remember thinking, OK, what does a politician need to do in this moment or the next moment or a few months later in order to reverse course? Right. It would have been very difficult, first of all, because everybody else was going along with this program. Right. So you basically just paint a huge target on your back as a granny killer and blah, blah, blah. But if you had had enough courage and if you had had enough skill politically to be able to whip people on side, particularly as we got into maybe the, the second year of the pandemic or a so-called pandemic you, I believe you could have spun a different story. You could have spun a story as a politician who wanted to save his people or her people. Well, you know, COVID's nasty. It was a nasty surprise and we've done some things to try to fix it, but we really have its number now. We know more now because we've done all this research and we know that proning works and we know that it's airborne and we know that masks outside are stupid and all these various things. And so now we have a different plan. We're not going to lock anybody down. We're going to target uh, our approaches to the people who really are vulnerable. We're going to do this, this, right? There's, there, you could have pivoted, I feel. You could have pivoted. But still no politician chose to do that. You know, I, and so I, I just, again, I, I, I despair at the, the lack of courage and true leadership in our leadership class during this period. It was absolutely woeful. And I mean, I don't pretend to know anything about who said what to whom in back rooms, but I do see very strongly political incentives for every single person in power during COVID to keep going with the program as long as possible. They painted themselves into this corner based on the idea that they would save the population from COVID. And that is part of the, the trajectory that we then had to be on. We had to be on this, you know, we will be saved by our politicians from COVID kind of trajectory, which led to the vaccine savior story and led to, you know, the lockdowns not being 
uh, lifted until supposedly we had a vaccine that was, you know, ready to go, which, of course, you know, has not proven by any stretch of the imagination to be the panacea that we were all promised. So it's it's a path dependency, a cowardice, uh, and, and just really a, a lack of courage that I've seen. Well, Gigi, I went out the front with a megaphone and was absolutely torn to shreds. I'm not um, surprised. I was accused of having blood on my hands. I was accused of wanting to... I, uh, I will personally overrun all the hospitals in Australia uh, by my actions, yep. and I will, I will, I will kill people. A, a very prominent Australian said, "You'll be responsible for killing people." Oh yeah. Oh, I had people say that to me as well. Absolutely. And there was no rhyme nor reason. This is this person would be one of the Australia's best known, brightest people. Uh, oh, education had nothing to do with it. Intelligence had nothing to do with it. If anything, I think the more educated and, and smarter people were, the the more they could rationalize almost anything because they got these big brains, right? And so when that brain becomes in service to the crowd logic, almost anything becomes possible and defensible. So I, I mean, I too, like you, I, if anything, I saw a reverse correlation between education and sense during this time because the people who were most educated were also those most exposed to these narratives that were constantly blaring out of, of you know, authority figures' mouths. And those who were not so educated, maybe way out in the bush somewhere, maybe weren't watching TV quite as much. They weren't in circles where everybody else was blaring on about all these supposed dangers. So I think they were just a little more immune and they were also more in touch with real risks because they may have had, for example, um, laboring jobs, you know, blue collar jobs where you actually have to take physical risks. Right. Uh, unlike a lot of the people making these policies and a lot of the people in the intelligentsia who were sitting around zooming in on their laptops and, and sipping a latte from home. You know, <laughs> it was it was nuts. These people were completely out of touch with real risk. And uh, and that's another whole chapter of this problem that I think we, we really have to work on as a society. I mean, this has shown me how much work we have to do to restore Australia as a, a happy, healthy, wealthy, strong country. We, we really need to do a lot of work and it's going to take years. Well, um, I can understand what you've just said. What I can't understand is how a community wanted farmers who work out in the fresh air to wear masks on their tractors <laughs> and to be vaccinated. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't pick up your milk. Can you believe that? Um, you're going to continue. I that. mean, I can believe it only because it's just another in this line of senseless policies that the government has issued during yeah. this time. A friend of it's mine is a retired senseless. nurse who was responsible for in the hospital, last hospital she was in, for the sanitation of the whole hospital. And she said um, to me, Russell, washing your hands is not going to make any difference. Social distancing is not going to make any difference. Putting a mask on is going to make any difference. It's this. Um, I don't mind I'm telling you, I'm a smoker. She said, "Explain. it's explained like this. If you're 20 feet away over there or 30 feet away and you have a smoke over here and I can smell your smoke, that's what that's what the airborne virus is like. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, yep, live, exactly. it doesn't live on handles and watches and, and you know, tables and things. It's just well, it's there in the air. Yeah, I mean, even more than than discussing the, you know, whether or not particular measures actually would have helped. I think what we also saw was a, a complete discussion about preventative or prophylactic things that one could do on the front foot. Right. And and by by doing that, by always focusing on the things you had to do to protect yourself, the government's messaging encouraged a kind of siege mentality in people. Rather than talking about, oh, make sure that you get enough sleep and uh, water and good nutrition and sunlight for vitamin D and make sure you've, you've got high enough zinc levels. And if you're elderly, make sure that you have good ventilation. And this, right, there was none of that. Zero. Right. So no actually early treatment or, or preparation to to make sure that the, our best defense against COVID, which is our immune system, was in the best possible shape. And so again, if the, if the health department had actually wanted to save lives and save human suffering, then they would have emphasized those things because those things have been known since the germ theory of disease to be effective against various kinds of infectious agents, right? Uh, and so, we, but we heard none of it. And so instead we were constantly told about, well, will this work, will this work, will this work against what was implicitly then portrayed as this hideous, 
you know, almost uh, just incredibly powerful uh, agent that we had to constantly be on alert about. So we had this elevated cortisol level and we were all just encouraged to stay constantly in a state of anxiety. That is also going to depress our immune systems, right? As well as being home under lockdown and having to share air with everybody in the house and not getting enough exercise and all the other stuff, right? So basically there was no emphasis on our actual strength against this virus. And everything was in in sort of almost in worship of the power of the virus. And that was that was partially because again, the politicians had painted themselves as saviors. They had to make sure that the thing they were saving us from was sufficiently fearsome. <laughs> so they have to continue to build up the fear, which of course they did, as we know, with advertising, with hiring actors, young people to act like they were in a hospital, you know, on a ventilator and, and gasping for breath when we know that COVID is largely not a risk to young people. So it was absolutely unconscionable. Um, and yeah, I, I think we have to do a lot of recovery in a lot of different ways that the, that people in power have no real concept of yet. And, and certainly have seen, I've, I've seen no uh, indication that they're willing to go there. Gigi, at the time I was a 70 year old lifelong smoker and I had about a less than 1% chance of dying of COVID. Yep, exactly. So my father's- my car or fall out of the sky in an aeroplane yeah. Quite high. That's right, exactly. So my, my father's 92 years old, you know, and he's living in New York State and, you know, male and very old. You'd think that, I mean, according to the messaging at the time, he was basically a dead duck if he caught COVID. But no, <laughs> if you actually look at the statistics, again, as long as he had enough vitamin D and, you know, was, was healthy, getting enough sleep and basically had a functioning immune system, even being older and being male, it was not a death sentence to get COVID. Um, so yeah, all these things got so completely pushed out of proportion. People's perceptions of risk uh, were totally manipulated. And so that was, you know, part of what, what maintained all of the drama. And of course now, even though, you know, as you say, the crisis continues, many people are starting to reestablish a sense of normalcy, but they still have an ego-based connection to much of what happened during that time because they became agents of some of these nonsense policies. They took their kids out of school. They made their kids wear masks. They didn't visit their dying parents in aged care homes. They, you know, basically were agents of the government's poor management. And so that means that they've become connected psychologically to the logic or illogic of those policies. And that means that there's going to be a humongous psychological barrier to reaching those people with the truth. And I think that's one of our biggest problems today as well. Now, you've written two books. There's truth in those books. What response have you had? Well, in the what I like to call the resistance and restoration community, it's been a it's been a fabulous response. So um, my first uh, book with Paul Friders and Michael Baker, The Great COVID Panic, What Happened, Why and What to Do Next. That was the first book published by Brownstone Institute, which um, was a new institute in September 2021. The book came out and the institute was launched and it's now the, I think, fastest growing libertarian think tank in the United States. Um, with pieces from all across the professions every day published up on its website, brownstone.org. The great Jeffrey Tucker is the founder and runner, basically, of that, of that institute. I've met him several times, and um, that's been an amazing collaboration we've had with him. We continue to blog on that site as well, uh, particularly about new solutions, systems that we might be able to work towards to, uh, to, to help this um, not happen again. And then, and of course, you know, it's on Amazon. We've gotten lots of positive reviews of it. Um, but in in more mainstream circles, of course, it, it isn't even talked about. I mean, no bookstores in Australia uh, stock it. My own University of New South Wales bookstore will not stock it. I've gone in there multiple times asking whether they would like to just buy some copies from me and resell them. Uh, no interest at all. Um, but then the second book, uh, Do Lockdowns and Border Closures Serve the Greater Good, was published by Connor Court, which, as you know, is an Australian-based publisher. And so they have done some marketing uh, for us. And I know at least one um, high school classroom that is using that book, which essentially lays out a cost benefit analysis of uh, the lockdowns and border closures as um, as the material for uh, mathematics classes. So that's that's nice, right? And that's led by a, a teacher who is very much part of the resistance and restoration movement, who himself publishes frequently in, uh, in various outlets on kind of more dissident or alternative perspectives on what's happened during COVID. So, uh, and you know, I've, I've given speeches all across the country. I've been on many broadcasts and print media uh, outlets talking about these books, talking about what's in there. But 
you know, more than anything, I think what's important is to organize with other like-minded people and um, and try to generate ideas for change. So the, the thing I'm most proud of actually is co-founding Australians for Science and Freedom, which is a free think tank uh, that we've co-founded with others in mid 2023. We had our inaugural conference at UNSW actually in November of last year, and it's cross-disciplinary. So in that sense, kind of horizontally integrated, but also vertically integrated. We bring in community leaders from across the country who are doing important things on the ground to help their communities and have been doing that since the COVID nonsense began to try to meet human needs and uh, and, and help people be healthy and happy and joyful and, and uh, self-insure against risks and therefore not have to look to the government as much to um, to suit them, to, to satisfy their various needs. And I think that is the way of the future, to strengthen communities, to reduce our reliance on central government, to take away the concentration of power that that government has had, and, uh, and think of new systems to still be a united Australia uh, and reject divisive sin stories and, and, and really focus on united strong Australia and the vision that we have for the future, but um, return to a lot of the wisdom that we see in, in sort of more traditional societies, I suppose, where the family is considered a very important, uh, probably building block of society and people look out for each other in the community. Um, you know, when, when we were kids, I'm sure you remember, we used to play on the street, right, after school, um, you know, ball games, frisbee, whatever, and there'd be block parties and all this. Where has that gone? Our community fabric has frayed so much, you know, most people don't even know the name of the person who lives across the street from them. And I think that's a very, very bad sign. I think that's one of the things that has accelerated our um, all vulnerability basically to being exploited in the ways that we have been. So I, do, I believe resuscitating communities is part of the way of the future. And I think our movement, the, the resistance and restoration movement must be the place where new ideas are generated, trialed, brainstormed, um, experimented with, because one day Australia is going to be ready for those blueprints and we need to have, have something to offer them. Um, if you were a um highly credentialed professional who took the vaccination themselves, had their partner vaccinated, had their children vaccinated, encouraged vaccination, and in some cases were paid $40 uh, a pop to give the vaccinations. Yeah. What's the psychology around not even entering into any sort of belief that there may be something wrong? Well, I mean, that's a very, very good question. And I think it, it if people can really Take that question seriously. It asks you to be compassionate with the people who have actually been kind of the bullies and the, the people who have been visiting this destruction on Australia during this time. So it really is asking for an act of love. And I think that is absolutely what we must do. And if you think about their position, they, as most people, want to be a good person. All right. The desire to be a good person, to be a moral person, is what has underpinned most people's actions during this period, including mine, right, and yours, I'm sure. And we just conceptualize what it is to be good, in, you know, in, in some kind of a different way, right? Considering what we saw around us, and it's a good thing to resist bad laws, sort of thing. But, but at the time, those people who did all of the the actions that you describe, they will have done them because of wanting to be a good person, because of wanting to be pro-social, wanting to protect people, wanting to care for the vulnerable all of the reasons why you and I have done. So we've, we're not different in the motivation, right? The problem is that the, the reality, the facts on the ground were not in accordance with those actions about vaccinating everybody, for example, being the pro-social actions. And so there's a huge, huge ego-related reason for such a person not to accept the reality of of what they did, um, that they probably have hurt some people on net. Um, now, there is a way around this that I was actually discussing with that very uh, math teacher I mentioned earlier um, the other day, because uh, he and his family came to our house and uh, had breakfast one uh, that day, and then we were just talking about how do we get out of this problem? You know, how do we get how do we address this psychological block that people have? And his suggestion was, well, what we need to do is feed people a story that gives them an out, a personal out. And that story could be, you have been misled by the authority figures. You have been manipulated. You have been fed a lie, in fact, a whole pack of lies. And so your mind and body became the puppet of, of, a, of a power drunk, corrupted system. And so you shouldn't in some sense feel that, you know, it's your personal responsibility. Now, 
we had a debate about this, whether this is a good idea, because on the one hand, you know, I can see the appeal of that. On the other hand, I don't like victimhood stories. <laughs> I think victimhood stories are dead end ideologies. And, and really what we need for the future is for people to feel confident and secure in themselves, not to feel that, you know, they've been uh, duped or otherwise misled or whatever. They need to take personal moral responsibility for things in their communities, in their families, in their personal lives. We need a return of personal accountability and responsibility and professional judgment being held up as important and, and you know, something that we rely on rather than relying on bureaucratic judgment. But on the other hand, there may be no other way for people to be able to be at peace with themselves, right? And you saw this during the, the trials, the Nuremberg trials, for example, a lot of the defenses came down to, well, I was just doing what I was told. Kind of a version of the same thing, right? So it's really an ethically fraught area. And I, I'm, not, I'm really truly not sure what the correct or optimal, in the language of economics, the optimal um, messaging would be to try to minimize damage to people while maximizing the speed with which we emerge from this COVID fog as a, as a people and recognize that we need to heal and we need to unite and we need to build back together a better and stronger society. Throughout this whole process, I've gone out of my way not to judge anybody for their decisions. I've never attacked them. I've never given any medical instruction. I yep. just said, this is what I'm doing and yep. this is why I'm doing it. That's all. But I had three very preferred, a gynecologist, an ex-GP and, and an existing GP coming to my office and say, I can't, I can't inject my patients with these things yeah. because it's bad for them. So yep. they all left the profession. Yep. Now, any politician with half a brain, if three people, three professionals come in and say that to you, you have to think it through. My spirit had already gone there anyway, so yeah. I wasn't taking them, but I had the three confirmations yeah. from those people who didn't have to come and find me, but they did. And Very they courageous left, people. And they left their role. And and we've them. seen that. I mean, thousands of people across Australia have taken that kind of a principled stance. Um, it, they're lucky to be able to do so, to have enough of a financial cushion or a community cushion to be able to do so. I, I know plenty of people who had kids to feed, literally, and didn't have the money in the bank to survive without the job that required the COVID vaccination. And, and so they were incredibly distressed at having to take it, incredibly. I know one person who, in order to save his marriage, took the vaccine with a bargain with his wife. Okay, can we just please not vaccinate the children? And that was the deal, right? I mean, these horrible, horrible sorts of trade-offs that you have to make, you know, that people have had to make during this time. I, I mean, it's just, this is why we need healing. We need a recognition of these harms. Um, I'm, I'm just that's actually that's today, sorry, go ahead. That's what I'm driving at, Professor. That's what I'm saying. They're yeah. not recognising the harm. They're not rec no. recognising the people who have been damaged, That's the right. marriages that have been damaged by the lockdowns, the marriages that have been um, damaged by the fallout between the husband and wife over the vaccinations to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. It goes on and on and on. Families split yep. up all over the place. And you're right, we need healing. But I'll put two things to you. Australians lost $3 billion to scammers last year. $3 billion. $3,000 million. Yep. And the point was a lot of people more than that have been scammed, but because of their situation and presence in the community, they're not telling anybody. Mm. Yeah. It's the same as a woman going through domestic violence in the home, and she's so ashamed of the fact that she's going through it, doesn't tell anybody, just endures. Yep, yep. Until death in many cases. So yeah. what I'm saying to you is, I have you got any, have you got any ideas around? You said you've had the conversation over breakfast. Have you had any other conversations that we might have with people to say, I'm not here to judge and condemn you mm. anything but because this mm. was worldwide and this was yeah. the most logical people in Australia doing this to me. And my mm. own daughter saying to me very early on, Dad, stop listening to that bulldust. Wow. Stop listening yeah. to that bulldust, you know. What's the matter with you? Yeah, no, I mean, at least, at least I, one of my friends has said, one of those two I talked about has said, you were right, we were wrong. That's amazing. That is, that is very Not both of them. Okay, but still, still, if one person can say that, I've had a few people come to me and saying that, saying that, but 
not people who were really, really far on the extreme of the, you know, the fanatical COVID cult stuff, uh, only people who were kind of a little bit wavering, not really committing, right? Because again, for them, the ego wasn't as involved. It wasn't as captured by the actions, by the narrative. Um, one of the people I interact with a lot as part of my work for Australians for Science and Freedom is a psychologist. And she very strongly believes that what people need is a, a drip feeding of the information rather than sort of just a, you know, here's everything that you guys got wrong kind of <laughs> approach, right? And the reason is because people need time to digest what has happened. And if we if we expect that that sort of full frontal assault is actually going to change minds, it won't. It's simply going to get people to be more defensive and, you know, bring up more reasons, more, you know, sort of accusations of, of our position, quote unquote, being, you know, the product of tinfoil conspiracy hat theorist stuff. So her suggestion was basically just drop a seed of one slightly contradictory fact, something that contradicts what somebody believes or, you know, seems to think or has said to you. Um, and then just an openness to discuss. Uh, which, again, requires so much love and compassion, particularly after four years of being denigrated, dismissed, canceled, yep. attacked, <laughs> gaslit, and everything else, right? It's the last thing that some some people in the resistance and restoration movement feel like they can do is to be loving, <laughs> right? But that is as usual, right? That is, I believe, the right approach. Um, and I have tried to be compassionate as well in my approach, uh, you know, like you. I mean, I've never told anybody what to do with their own bodies. And, you know, I have said... What I think, which is that a lot of the policies are harming people, including children, but uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of libertarian in some in some respects in relation to my thoughts about people's own responsibility for their actions. I don't want to be responsible for somebody else's actions. I'm responsible for mine and for putting my view because I am paid by the Australian taxpayer. Right? I mean, I work at a public university, so I have a duty professionally to comment upon policies that are affecting Australian taxpayers. And my goodness, were the COVID policies a mass economic policy. They were the biggest economic policy, has a huge effects on the economy of, of our generation, right? So obviously I felt I needed to speak out. Um, but at the same time, and I have said many, many things, many facts appear. So it is kind of like a full frontal assault if you read my books. But in one-on-one -on -one conversations that your listeners may have with their family members or friends who are still captured, what I would recommend is a, is a slow, gentle, loving, compassionate sort of approach and a willingness if you do see that that pennies are starting to drop and somebody is starting to feel distressed because their entire vision of the way the world works and what they can trust is coming crashing down the willingness to support them and to be there and to comfort them to show them that there is a group they can join, which is the restoration movement. There is a bunch of people in Australia who have seen what has happened, are angry and sad and despairing about it, but are optimistic that we can build something more. Because what those people need is another group, not the group that they're in now, which is the, you know, the pro lockdown, pro mandate, fanatical COVID cult stuff, right? They need a group that is promoting joy and a positive future and unity and and health, actual health and good education and critical thought. All of the things that I was taught we were gifted with from the kind of post enlightenment Western civilization that we came from. So so that's what I want us. And I think we need to to actively work on creating that community, showing people implicitly that that is a safe community, that is a community of the future and you can be happy in this community and and we can offer you fellowship companionship and help as you try to reconstruct your notion of truth i'm reading keith miller's um, life story at the moment former australian cricketer um, right. and what why i bring it to your attention was great book too by the way um, yeah. um he would engage the crowd if the match he wasn't there necessarily to win like the other cricketers, the, the Bradmans and the Hassets, he was there to engage with the crowd. And he'd yeah. do that with the ball and with the bat and with his actions, to love him or to hate him, but to create emotion within the <laughs> ground. Yeah. And um, I've, I've said to my staff, we're not getting through to the MCG cricket crowd or the MCG football crowd. Yeah. It's just an echo chamber for all of us. No, I, yeah. I need ways. Yeah. To break out into that group because if I do something political, um, such as Nemesis, the show that was on television recently on ABC, yeah, everybody wants to talk to me about it. 
Yeah. But I do a show with you today. We talk about the great COVID panic and um, the greater good, and no one talks to me about it. No yeah. one comes to me and says, oh, uh, and yet these um, videos are going out constantly, day after day after day, we're sending them out. Yeah. And yet we get knocked off YouTube, we get pulled down on Facebook, we're not allowed to play it anywhere. Um, and so they're still out there denying what we're talking about. And all yeah. I ask them questions. I said, there are excess deaths in Australia and the UK and America yeah. and across the world. Can yeah. you please explain to me why? If it's not the vaccines, what is it and why aren't we talking about it? Yep. You know, yep. and you hear of somebody who's lost somebody and they say, oh, they died, their cancer came back and they were dead within three weeks. I can't, you know, I can think I remember one case of someone being diagnosed with cancer and being dead in three weeks. Yep. No, the well, excess death question, I mean, that should be the $64 million question right now. That should be the biggest question on the minds of the government. Because this, I mean, if, 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 if you're supposed to be safeguarding the welfare of Australians and you're losing tens of thousands more than you should be losing based on historical precedent, that's a big flashing red signal that you're doing something wrong, right? <laughs> and you need to figure out quickly what it is, but there's been no interest in that. And I mean, I I totally agree with you. The, the ways in which I have broken through most have been on mainstream media channels. So when I'm asked to go on ABC, for example, or Nine News or Seven or 10 or one of these big name channels, right? Sky maybe, but not as much. And usually the, the, the bigger kind of you know, the ones that are watched by the cricket crowds, right? The MCG yeah. crowds. That is when sometimes I can make a little bit of a difference. So ABC q and I've been on ABC q and five times, I think four or five times. Every time I go on, I talk about these things to the extent that I can, because these are the most important things we should be talking about. And every time I get a slew of emails back, some of whom are just saying, oh, thank you for finally speaking sense. And then a few of whom are like, oh, I, I didn't quite understand what you meant about this, particularly the early ones that I did in 2020 and 2021. And that gives me an opportunity to open the dialogue. So that is how you reach people. Get on the big channels, right? So like Nemesis, I guess, was on a big channel, right? So that is going to generate more response. Just there's more eyeballs. That's really what it is. And, you know, SMH, the Sydney Morning Herald, has now started this uh, series of pieces about, and they started, they started, I think, earlier this week talking about the harms to children of school closures. I think that may possibly start to wake people up because again mainstream media right that is a pretty mainstream paper people will read that and think oh it's okay to now talk about this even if they're still captured by the crowd thing well now the crowd is saying that maybe this was a bad idea okay now it's okay to think that right and so that starts to open up people's minds to maybe an alternative view of the other pandemic measures as well so i, I don't think there's any magic bullet i would love there to be but you know what the charles mckay says right people go mad in crowds and they only wake up slowly one by one so there's no magic switch. You just have to go one by one, ha hope to reach as many people as possible, say your message in multiple different ways, stay compassionate, keep trying, and uh, and be in it for the long run. What do you? How do you think we can take, uh, I, I know it, I take what you've just said then. Um, every time I was actually the chair of and on the Human Rights Committee of the Parliament for quite a while, and every time I spoke to a union or an organization about the human rights around the COVID response. I just thought I was a bit weird. Why would I be asking yep. such a question? Of yep. course, we ask the human rights of our people, you know. Um, it was just <laughs> devastating. Devastating. Yeah, but I mean, this is the brilliance of George Orwell, right? I mean, the, you know, the, having the Ministry of Truth, which puts out lies having the Ministry of Peace, which conducts war. I mean, we are, as humans, completely capable of com of totally distorting the meaning of terms. And this is one of the interesting things that I've noticed sort of anthropologically or linguistically in this period as well, is that terms that we think we know, right? We think we understand what they mean, have actually slowly become dissociated from their actual meaning. So, um, you know, so words like, for example, green or sustainable, now are not really linked to things, to actions and, and real material impacts that I would have thought would actually be thought of as truly green or sustainable, right? And so the same thing is true in a lot of these health uh, and, and human rights discussions as well. The notion of the human right, right? What is a right? Well, you know, the right to be safe from COVID. What? <laughs> right? What about the just more basic rights than that? Like the right to move around as you would like, the right to show your face, right? It just has become this, this 
like a very, very weird morphing of, of words, which is something, again, that I think, you know, we need to address by using words appropriately, using words and defining our terms and saying, this is what this means and no nonsense about this. <laughs> Here's what we mean by this. And, and, and that just means, again, continued communication, continued um, putting of an alternative perspective out there, because if we don't put it, who's going to put it? I'm speaking with Professor Gigi Foster. Professor, what sort of pushback have you had recently, though, more recently? Um, to be honest, I have had more than anything just a kind of uh, silence from the other side, shall we say, a desire clearly to just push everything that happened under the rug, forget about it, memory hole it. So if anything, I would say that there's been a, a recognition that the more this stuff gets talked about, the more that rationality and sanity may prevail. So there's been a pivot on the other side towards silence, towards, uh, you know, focusing on the next big thing, whatever that is, you know, the, the Russia-Ukraine thing, the Israeli-Palestine conflict, uh, you know, green energy solutions, so-called, etc. So I think that's that's really the biggest issue now in terms of trying to engage. Um, and I certainly still feel quite a frosty situation within my own department, but I also have to be grateful to my university for not firing me during this time or trying to muzzle me at all. Um, that's been quite amazing to me. They never had a vaccine mandate either, so I'm, I'm very grateful to UNSW. And they have been trying to get people back on campus, and even though there are still little posters around the place about masking and social distancing, pretty much people just see them as part of the furniture now. They're not really abiding by them. So. You know, if if you say now to someone in the corridor something about, oh, you know, I certainly hope we don't do these lockdowns again, they'll usually kind of, you know, say, yeah, it was kind of silly or, you know, it was awfully bad or whatever. So there's kind of a grudging agreement that maybe it was a bad thing, but really no willingness or ability to engage with the full depth of the pain that was caused, uh, the damage that was done. Um, so I would say I get a lot less pushback now. And um, and yeah, the bigger problem is just basically the memory holding that people are trying to do of the whole problem. Um, I'm surprised that the University of New South Wales, uh, unlike every other institution, allowed someone like you to continue. You must have had a very strong backer in there somewhere. You know, I have really wondered about it over the years. I, I don't know what it is. Um, it's possible that somebody uh, in the hierarchy of the university liked me or thought that I might be an insurance policy, perhaps, against possibly, you know, the COVID policies being found out later to have been wrong. Um, I also am very careful about what I say. I mean, I try to say things that are only very much backed up by my own professional expertise and um, professional judgment, things I've studied, uh, data that I've looked at, so I don't overstep my bounds. Um, and of course, like you, I, I don't call other people names or, you know, try to tell no. them what to do, or, you know, go outside my lane. So I think those things have helped. The other thing that's really helped, honestly, Russell, is that I'm useful to the university in other ways. I'm a nationally awarded teacher. I run the Australian Economics Olympiad and the Australasian Economics Olympiad, the Consortium for Inclusive Economics Education. Um, I, I do research, obviously. So I do things that the department and the university value. And so it's kind of like a, I'm a package deal. So if they were to get rid of me, the other thing is I'm a woman, right? So they may think that the current climate would make it very difficult for them to fire me. Uh, and I have so many contacts in the media. There might be a sense that, well, if we did fire her, she'd go screaming to the media and we'd be accused of misogyny or whatever. It is. I don't know what they think, but maybe there's a stick component as well. Um, you know, a, a hesitancy to do anything about me because they're they're afraid of the repercussions. But whatever it is, I'm, I'm, I'll take it and I'm happy. Uh, and I haven't been told if I do have a, a supporter in the ranks. I don't know who that person is, but, you know, if that person's listening, thank you very much. It's just the best story because all of the stories I've received of people like yourself being completely mandated out of the job, out of the university, out of the school, out of the company, you know, as low down as agricultural machinery companies that told, you know, were told unless their staff were mandated, now, you may help me with one more one more thing before you go, and there'll be lots mm. more, really. But um, after businesses were told to um, collect this information and hand it over to the authorities if required, mm. um, they are now being told to destroy it. Uh, to get Is that to get rid of all the evidence? Why, why would they have to destroy it? Because they're, they're saying now it's private information held by a business they shouldn't hold. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, that, that opens all sorts of questions, doesn't it? If, if it's private information, why were they collecting it in the first place? Uh, I remember the, the joke going around at the time about how, you know, if you wanted to know your wife's um, health status, you couldn't ask her, you couldn't ask her doctor, but you could ask the restaurant down the street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous, right? So it's obviously a complete perversion of, of our normal standards, what happened during that time. And so I think there's a kind of backpedaling response that you're seeing in that in that request. And of course, you know, you may know this as well. It's a very Australian thing to claim confidentiality of information in order to protect people in authority, right? So we have the same problem when we're trying to get data on what's happening in Australia through individual records uh, of people, you know, tax records or or whatever records to try to, you know, in social science to work out whether policies are working or what, what people are doing in various ways. It's very difficult to get really complete information, much more difficult than in the US where I did my graduate training. Um, obviously, there need to be safeguards, but you allow people, you allow analysts to look at data because that gives you a, a read on what's happening in your country. But in this country, we have a lot of top coding. We have a lot of um, just a lot of kind of weird Weird data handling and management protocols, which actually actively prohibit us from knowing what's going on in our in our country. And the same, of course, is very true for um, deaths and vaccines. Right? We 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 really have had a total clam up about you know, what what actually has gone on in that space? How many people have been vaccinated? What's the health history? We haven't followed people adequately. We don't have the data that we can just analyze. There's always little holes in data and stuff. You have to wait till whistleblowers come out, like the New Zealand person, to, to actually get a proper, you know, read on this stuff. And even then, we don't know whether it's actually, you know, real data. I mean, it's just a, it's a comedy of errors. <laughs> you know, if the health department really cared, they'd be tracking this stuff and they would invite independent analysis of the good quality data that they would have. And that's the model we should have in our heads. That's the thing against we should be comparing their actual behavior. Um, again, be on the front foot. Don't just react, be on the front foot. Here is the model that you should be following based on everything we know and the basic pillars of Western civilization. You're not following it, okay? Then you are in error and we're gonna call you out on that and we're going to demand that or set up a new system where uh, you no longer have the power to act in that way. Well, it seems that um, government departments, though, have a different uh, authority. I was watching Meet the, well, the Press Club the other day with the head of the ATO, and mm -hmm. he said, oh, no, we can tell who's being and being their property um, because we now have access to the estate agents' um, rent rolls and, and you know, state uh, rental statements. Yeah. And... Uh, I thought, oh, that's new. I didn't know they're allowed to do that. Indeed, and if they're allowed to do that, crossed, why not everybody else, right? Why not? Why not the other analysts? Yeah. They cross that, cross match that with other state bodies to find out who is renting their house out for the weekend to you and I without telling the government. Yep, exactly. And again, no, 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 because they want to put a tax on those people, an extra tax on those people. Yep, yep. So this shows you again the conceit of people who will enjoy that kind of concentrated power. When we set up a, a, a central government that has too much power and basically it creates this, uh, this elite that is very much divorced from the actual needs of its community, um, the, the you know, real people's actual everyday wants and desires and, and needs, then you, you're going to get an elite that comes up with you know, a sort of self-congratulatory attitude and uh, basically thinks of themselves as uh, as God's gift. Oh, yeah, we we have the right to do this. We are we are special people somehow. That's extremely damaging. That's a very, very bad psychosocial phenomenon. And, you know, they are people just like us. And if they are allowed to look at these data on behalf of the people of Australia, so too should any other independent analyst who, you know, has some kind of credential, whatever. You can think about ways to make this possible, but protecting people but allowing us to see what's really going on um, because otherwise it's it's just uh, abuse by the elites. Um, on the other side of that, governments seem to be dividing the community by saying, oh, they're just wealthy people with a holiday house to rent out. They're not like us, so you're allowed to do that to them. Because yeah, again, but again, uh, <laughs> 
I mean, th this no, that's a divisive narrative. That's just like the narrative that, you know, all women have been oppressed by men from, you know, for, for generations or that the indigenous people have been oppressed by, by white people in Australia for generations or whatever. These are divisive narratives. Obviously, violence has happened between people. We are a violent species, but we have so much more to gain from being unified than we have from, from seeing each other in, in buckets of others. You know, here's us and here's the other. That's That has led to the destruction of societies, again, throughout history. We need to learn from history and realize the way to, to, to stop the problems we are having now is stop with the division, unite as an actual full people of Australia, and recognize the betrayal of people in elite positions who have formed themselves into this class who are pretty much divorced from the rest of us, um, and, and see that for what it is. That is, that is a betrayal. So we need to restructure power dynamics and, and as I say, revitalize communities in order to reclaim the power that we actually have. Gigi Foster, your cat is letting me know it's time to go. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. I have a feeling that you and I might be talking at some length many times in the future. It would be my pleasure, Russell. Thank you so Please much for having me on. I said that this particular day, the 23rd of February, 2024. <laughs> Professor Will Gigi do. Foster, thanks for being on the program. We look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so much, Russell. Bye.